Hello and welcome. My name is Carol Carter and I'm the founder and the CEO of Global Minded. We are dedicated to creating a capable and diverse talent pipeline to get more women, people of color, any way you can define diversity into the education, economic mobility, employment and leadership pipeline. So we do that in a number of ways. We have an annual conference that will be virtual this year and it actually launches tomorrow. This is Earth Week. So we'll be launching with Earth Week and we'll be going over the next 10 weeks um, to the latter part of June. So we hope you can join us for those sessions. Most all of them will be at the same time, two o'clock every day. And uh, we also every month have uh, equity events. Dr. Ryan Ross started last July with these equity events and has really built an incredible community of practice. So we're um, really delighted today to have he and his guests here and their topic is navigating student success, advising and advocacy during and after the pandemic. And we also wanna thank the um, community college system of Colorado because they allow Ryan to do these with us every single month. And um, Ryan, with that, I wanna pass it right over to you because it's gonna be, I know, a big um, big topic, what we're covering today, and then what we will cover when we find out more information. Yeah, good evening, everyone. And it is good to see you on. Thank you guys for taking the time and making the space to be here for, for another month of Get Comfortable Being Uncomfortable. Really excited for our guest today. We're gonna have as Carol said, a conversation about um, student advocacy and, and what that's looked like during and after the pandemic. But before we get to that, I just have to take a moment and, um, and uh, just say thank you all for being present. And then also that I recognize that right now is just a, a tenuous time in our country. Um, we're, we're actually navigating two pandemics, the social injustice and inequity that we're facing is challenging. We're moments away from the verdict involving the, the involving uh, Derek Chauvin and George Floyd. And um, if you're if you're like me, in, when it comes to that, there's anxiety. There's you you feel your stomach turning. There's there's all kinds of things happening. And so just just to let you know, you know, this is the get comfortable being uncomfortable uh, platform. And so. At any moment, we may kind of switch and, and go into that direction and start having some of that conversation, or it might just, you know, as, as it relates to advocacy, this is something that we have to think about on our campuses. And so we may be bringing that into our conversation today. But I just want to say from an equity standpoint, um, right now, grace is really important. Um, understanding how you're feeling and honoring your feelings and your emotions right now is really important. Um, and, um, you know, no matter what happens, you know, we have to understand the, the pathway forward is together and you know, we have to work um, guilty or innocent. We've got to continue to address the inequities that we face in the society because we've got a long, long way to go. Um, that being said, again, thank you for being here. Um, this space is, is open. Our, our, our guests are tremendous. I'm excited to, our guests are going to more formally introduce themselves, but I'm really excited to have uh, my colleague, Dr. Lisa Mady Edwards from the uh, from Arapaho Community College. Um, I'm, I'm excited to have Dr. Kimberly Grayson, a principal uh, in K-12, who's just doing tremendous work and is an staunch student advocate in Denver Public Schools. Uh, Troy Abwalter, who has spent time in Colorado and now in Minnesota. Um, when, you, when I think about advocacy and innovation and technology and intellect, that's what, uh, that's what you get, you get Troy. And then it is an absolute pleasure to have Dr. Cynthia Goose Grace in here um, from Metro Community College in Omaha, Nebraska. And um, it's kind of a kind of a a, a, hum, a humble moment and a fan moment because Dr. Dr. Gooch Grayson um, was one of my informal advisors when I was a, a young um, college student running around Nebraska. And so we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> But I'm so glad that she's here and it's such an honor to be doing this work and to be able to share the stage with someone who has inspired me to do this work. But that being said, I'm just gonna go, um, starting with you, uh, Lisa, could you give a quick introduction of yourself? And as you do that, kind of give us your why, why student advocacy, why this work? And we will go around to the rest of the uh, panelists, Lisa. Thank you, Ryan. 
Um, well, I am Lisa Mady Edwards, and I have the honor of serving as the Vice President of Student Affairs at Arapahoe Community College. And my why is that it was the outreach of someone who was in student affairs that saved me as a college student coming from a working class family. Um, my dad had gone to community college while I was a child on the veterans benefits. And so I was kind of half gin and it was the, the person who, who reached out and saved me and intervened when I was struggling as a college student that made me want and be called to this work. So um, I really have enjoyed doing it and I feel like it's my passion to be able to serve students and to serve staff in helping us figure out how to serve those that want to have their career and academic dreams come true. And I found my home after being at various private liberal arts colleges, I'm going to the community college system. That's just where my joy and love is. And that's where I am today. Welcome, thank you. Dr. Dr. Grayson. Hi, um, thank you for having me. My why is to always be able to speak and advocate for my students. Um, my students are often those individuals that are left voiceless. And I always wanna make sure that they know the importance of advocating for themselves, how powerful their student voice is, and making sure that they understand that they have a leader um, that is supporting them and walking alongside them. We have to have advocates, change agents in education um, because the education that our students are receiving right now is broken. And I think the pandemic has highlighted how broken this system is. And so I truly am here to help uh, change the system of education, and especially being a Black leader and our students not seeing very many Black leaders um, in their schools, people that look like them that are here to help make history and make the changes that are necessary for them to thrive. Thank you. Troy. Well, thanks, Doc Ross, for the invite today. And as always, your generosity of spirit is unfailing. So thank you for those kind comments. And I'm also excited to be um, virtually sitting in with this very uh, talented panel of professionals. Very excited to be here. Originally, I had a more um, academic or technical response to this question, but right now that feels a little bit stilted. So instead, what I'll say as for my why uh, is this. I think of all the, the suffering my students have endured this past year due to the COVID pandemic, due to the racial injustice pandemic, due to political violence, due to trauma. I think of their despair, their overwhelm, loneliness, their stress, and I think of all the disproportionate impacts um, that I've seen. But then on the other hand, I, I think of the resiliency, the passion, the strength, and the will to survive in the students that I serve. And so there's this sort of complex mix of, of despair in the current situation and, and the struggles of the world combined with this um, intense hope and faith that uh, students provide me. And so that's really what keeps me in the game. So I'm excited to be here. And again, thanks for the invite. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Goose Grayson. Thank you, Dr. Ross, for the invitation as well. Uh, my why is similar to that that others have mentioned, but it was the late trio advocate, Jimmy Smith, my late professor, the Reverend Dr. Michael W. Combs, and my trio advisor, Vaughn Robertson, all from the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. They pushed me to complete my degree as a first-generation college student by any means necessary. They poured into me and told me that I was enough. And once I had the opportunity to work in spaces advocating for students, I vowed to do all that I could do to make crooked places straight for those who are marginalized, forgotten, and historically discriminated against in higher education. And I believe that if I have that opportunity, if not me, then who? So those are my whys. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and Dr. Grayson mentioned that the system um, 
is broken and and I, and I would say that the system is broken for certain people but unfortunately I think sometimes it, it's it's working the way it was designed to work but but speaking of being broken I think it's really hard to be present as a professional doing this work if you're not okay and so I just want to take a moment and just check in with you how are you doing there's a lot happening right now and before we jump in you know go down this roller coaster i just want to just give some space and give a moment for you to check in how are you doing uh, how are you managing to to be as present as, as you can be during these times and, and and just go ahead and jump in um uh, fortunately i'll start um it is very very hard um i fear for my staff that are black and latino um i fear for my family members um, my colleagues, such as yourself, and um, I have anxiety at times. How do I cope? Um, I talk, I pray, um, and I minimize how much TV I watch. You know, honestly, I have to. Um, so, and I, you know, I like to take walks. I like to read and, and watch mindless TV. And those are ways that um, I've been able to pretty much stay sane. Yeah. Any other, any other want to share there? I'd agree. I think being a leader in, um, at a college right now and being worried about my staff, my students, my family, my friends, you know, and, and, knowing the impact on me as a white woman and not even being able to, you know, empathizing, but not living in the shoes of what it is for my colleagues and dear friends who have identities that are being daily traumatized the way beyond we are, I think is a lot to carry. And, and talking about self-care, but then also not modeling self-care, I know when I'm doing poorly on it. And I agree, not looking at images, um, on TV, I find myself watching a lot less of that and having very selective reading for my self-care. Mm -hmm. um, you know, nature, good, and family time, good, and remembering it's okay to find joy in small things. I think sometimes we feel guilty of doing that at times, but it is okay. I'll, I'll just add one of the, uh, I mean, there's been a lot of struggles this past year, but uh, for me, uh, as someone who really likes to do right by my students and, and my staff, for me to be in a situation where I'm not able to do my best work at work because of all the other things going on, uh, that has been challenging. And another challenging thing has simply been all the uncertainty. And if a student comes to me and I feel like I should have something helpful to say, and sometimes <laughs> this past year, I haven't, I haven't known what to say or how to be helpful. Um, and so that's been, that's been hard. Uh, I've leaned a lot on my staff and on my students and I've learned um, you know, a lot from them and just in their resiliency and their strength, uh, but it's been, a, it's been a tough year. All right, thank you. Thank you guys for sharing. Um, could, could jump in. Um, our first question is, is around, you know, inequity, right? Um, so most people um, would argue that education is the civil rights issue of today. And now we have these two pandemics that we're, that we're experiencing, uh, COVID-19, social unrest. Um, how have these things impacted the way you do your job uh, on a daily basis? Has it, how has it shifted your approach and providing resources and services, kind of how have you had to rethink those kinds of things? And are you just seeing greater inequity? Do you feel like, you know, the more you do, the more you have to do? Uh, and, and, we, and we can just go ahead and jump in. We'll just go ahead and open up our conversation. We'll start, we'll start with, let's, let's start with Kim. Let's, let's, let's hear what's happening on the K-12 front. And you work know, our way around. I, I was also thinking about your previous question. Um, the pandemic, the social unrest is heavy. Mm -hmm. And 
my students, making sure it's not just my students, it's my staff, um, but at the same time that we're trying to address the social and emotional needs of my students, I, as a leader, have to make sure that my staff is okay. It's similar to when you're on the airplane, put your own air mask on first, your oxygen mask first. And if my staff is not okay, particularly my staff of color, my black staff, you know, how are they to tend to and help with my students that are not okay? And so it's very heavy for me. Um, my daughter is in sixth grade and she attends my school. My son graduated from my school in 2018. And to see how it weighs on my daughter and, you know, then my black son, all of this and me being high risk with the pandemic and knowing that I have faculty that's high risk, but yet um, we have, we all feel this obligation to be in person with our students, especially if they're not engaging from working remotely. Um, and it's, there's not an off button for me this year. It's nonstop and I feel like I'm often carrying or experiencing secondhand trauma daily, um, either hearing from my students whose family members have caught COVID and have passed away or have caught COVID and family members are in the hospital and now my students are at home and they don't have a meal or anything to eat, you know, they're still reaching out to us. And so I guess I can say that MLK is a true family because throughout all of this, my students still know who to call on. You know, Grace and my mom's in ICU and I haven't eaten for two days. Okay, got it. I got to shift gears and get food to your home. Um, and then the social unrest and, you know, the day-to-day -day things that my podcast girls are doing to fight social unrest and to change, um, history, I feel like we're moving in the right direction. Um, we're often up against barriers nationwide, um, or sometimes even within our own district, but in our school building, I feel like we are, we're moving in the right direction. And we know that we have to reimagine how school is because we can't go back the same next year. What about I think? Oh, I, I th I'll yeah. jump in. So I'll just say, I, I think there are certain aspects of student support programming that require a technical solution. And I think that is an easier reach this year. So um, having a hard time engaging. So what are some different ways we can go about it or um, having some financial challenges or some ways we can rework financial aid. So there's you know a lot of different things we've done in sort of the technical solutions realm, but the most challenging work um, and I think it's to the point that's been made a few times already is more of the, just those human challenges, just the human dimension of, of the struggle. And what we've seen um, on my campus, and I think pretty common across a lot of campuses is a real precipitous decline in the mental health of our students, as well as our, our faculty and our staff. And so we've been trying to, you know, reallocate resources um, towards that end. We've been trying to bring on additional staffing, try to bring on an intercultural uh, mental health therapist. Uh, but then when you're a student support person and you're on that front line and that student's you know, right there in your office, and I'm not a mental health therapist, uh, but yeah, you have to be able to you know, hopefully try to be helpful. Um, just having those you know, real vulnerable heart-to-heart -heart conversations. Um, I feel like I've had a lot of those this past year. But yeah, echoing what was just said, I mean, you know, just the mental health side of things. Um, and it's definitely a disproportionate impact. That's, that's been very challenging. So what was the shift like? I mean, the pandemic, like I, re I remember it was like, I was in a full on board meeting on like March 14th last year. And then on March 17th, 
you know, I'm just trying to see how I can be helpful to the vice presidents in our system. And, and everybody was, you know, how do we provide food? How do we, how do we provide services? You know, how do we go from all of our classes to online? Um, and I think a lot of focus was on the, how do we get from outside of the classroom to um, being at home on computers, but, you know, there wasn't much, in my opinion, and it maybe it might be different for you, but there wasn't a lot of public conversation on, okay, what, what happens to the non-academic barriers that we face every day that we can do a really good job in person, seeing them, giving a hug, being able to look somebody in the eye, you know, you look a little skinny today, right? Like, have you eaten? Have you taken your medication? All of that, how, what did you do or how have you guys managed that pivot and still provide the kind of care that you've been able to provide um because it's at, at your institutions it's really amazing what you guys have been able to do um i can speak to that somewhat um i believe one of my staff persons is um tuned in james hawthorne he's the director of veterans upward bound he and his staff have been phenomenal um, he executed the zoom training for all trio programs so that um you know some people uh, had the skill and some not so much. And so that was a quick pivot uh, so that we could virtually reach out and connect with our students. Um, in addition to using cell phones, Duo, um, FaceTime, all of those things, um, we celebrated wins often and regular, just as we would in face-to-face. -face. Um, we had Zoom parties with, you know, to celebrate the students' wins with DJs and um, celebrating their successes in inside the classroom and outside of the classroom. Also, um, just checking in with our students and participants because with negativity spewing last fall from the highest office in the land, it wear on our students and our staff, um, it wore on them. And so just um, virtual, virtually checking in and phone calls and things of that nature, um, thinking outside of the box with our veterans and um, in Veterans Upward Bound, the staff, they had drive-by food boxes, the drive-by packet distributions so that every single service that we offer to them face-to-face -face could be offered to them virtually or in a safe manner. So really pleased with the way that that happened. Um, so much so um, one student did not know he was getting a stipend. And when he opened his meal box, he cried. He cried. Um, black male army veteran cried. So um, that was, you know, just, I have to, say the staff really stepped up um, and showed in so many ways how much they care for our participants. Hey, I second that our staff were incredible and we immediately um, garnered a, along with them trying to pivot to work from home and care for their children and care for their families and manage, you know, all of their own health in relation to everything. Um, we called all of our students um, and whether or not we reached them, we were able to leave a message and it wasn't about anything except care, right? To show them care and love was the intent. And if they needed something that we had a way to then say what that was. So you need a laptop, we'll get you a laptop. You need food, we're gonna get a grocery card. You know, and there were a lot of pivots that had to happen in the, um, creativity and the care of the staff while still managing their own anxiety and fear and families was incredible. I mean, it really was one of those things that showed a lot of love to our students and I think made a difference. You know, it wasn't a, we want you to do something. We want you to do these things. It was a complete, hey, we're calling to check in on you. How are you doing? How are things going? Are you okay? Do you know that we have counseling and you can be on a phone with a counselor? You know, what do you need on that? Um, and, you know, staff came to 
hand out things, you know, when they felt anxious about that, but to safely figure out how to safely be in person for our students who needed that. And again, the creativity, staff who like, I got this Zoom thing down, or I learned how to use SharePoint. Let me share that with you so that you can use these tools to be effective working from home. Um, that really played into it and staff anticipating and advocating for students. That was a great piece too. Um, doc, Dr. Grayson, in, 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 the, in the DPS environment, what was that like for you? You know, I, I, I would like to say I have great like instincts. And so I felt that we were going to be released for remote learning a few weeks before. And I remember calling my admin team into my conference room, talking to them about this. Um, but I didn't think it would be for an entire school year. Um, you know, we often think back to, we didn't get to hug our kids last year. We just sent them out the door. And those were my seniors that were graduating. And so graduation became very difficult because we still wanted to honor them and provide them with a true graduation, well, a graduation in the truest form during a pandemic. Um, and then we just saw students kind of go downhill from there. Engagement was lost. Um, and so at the beginning of this year, um, we called every student, spoke to every student. I sent my student culture team out to do home visits with students that we couldn't get in touch with. And, you know, it's difficult to continue to gauge all 1300 of my students. And so we are consistently sending out a social and emotional survey during their advisory class every week. We look at the survey results and then we speak to the students based off of what their survey um, is informing us. What supports do they need? How can we jump in and continue to help them be it academically, uh, social, emotionally, or even just a support with their families? Um, but I will also say, like, in addition to that, I had to create a group for my faculty. Um, and so my faculty has a group called the Ujima Belong Group. And that's for my Black staff members. Because again, I have to make sure, you know, are they okay? I'm not okay. So I know that they're not okay. And we're on the front lines with our students. And so I think the shift is how do we maintain this connection with students, especially the hard to reach or hard to engage students? And then how do I make sure my faculty is okay? Um, sometimes it's, it seems to be impossible because I have my own weight of just being a black leader and, and seeing everything that's happening. Um, and I was explaining to my staff, like oftentimes, I still show up with a smile because I know that that's what I have to do when sometimes I just want to break down and cry. You know, um, one of the things that's been interesting um, as, we, as we talk about advocacy um, and student services and, and trying to serve all our students is that there are so many groups of students and sometimes as we're doing the work and we're well-intentioned, sometimes we leave students out um, or we're not completely thinking about entire populations. And it makes me think about, you know, like from a K-12 environment, you know, students want IEP, whether they be gifted or um, just need an additional support or students um, who need accessibility or disability services, um, mental health, those kinds of things. And my question for you guys, two parts is, one, how have you managed to ensure that you keep advocacy for, for all populations and, and, and especially special populations that sometimes get overlooked? And what advice would you give for folks on here to um, ensure that they can do that in their programs or institutions or organizations? Uh, Lisa, why don't we start with you on that one? I need a minute to reflect a little bit on that, if that's okay. Yeah, 
that's, that's, that's I'm gonna let you pass to someone else first. <laughs> that's totally fine. All right, Troy, we're gonna come. We're gonna swing your way. Yeah, this is a uh, it's definitely a, a great question and a challenging one, and um, you know I'm pretty reluctant to give advice these days because it's uh, kind of figured out as we go here. But so in my situation, I'm at um, a small private, predominantly white institution in northern Minnesota, 150 miles north of Minneapolis, St. Paul. And so when uh, George Floyd was killed last summer and we had uh, a lot of our students were down in the Minneapolis, St. Paul area participating in the protests. Uh, and then at the same time, there was a restructure um, at my institution and the Office of Diversity and Inclusion was, was shuffled around a little bit. And, and so it just created this really challenging dynamic. Uh, and, and my program serves students of color, the, the Trio McNair Scholars Program. And so um, having challenging conversations uh, about race and about conflict is hard enough in, in normal times. And then now you're in this pandemic situation where you know, it's all virtual communication and it's, it's emails and everyone's exhausted and on edge and, you know, misinformation can easily develop in terms of who said what. Uh, and so that was incredibly challenging. Uh, and then in the role of myself and the other McNair staff trying to, trying to be mediators and liaisons and um, trying to really support students in those difficult spaces. Um, Again, I, I don't think I have any advice, but but it was uh, incredibly challenging, and and just being there for our students and and acknowledging and affirming their experiences and um, advocating as best we could, you know, uplifting their voices. Um, yeah, it's, uh, again, I don't really have any advice, but it's a uh, it was challenging, I'll say. Yeah, and just as a quick follow up, Troy. Um, you know, being at the program director level on the ground, really seeing the students, um, not necessarily pushing for advice, but could you talk a little bit about how you have ha how you've had to engage with your vice president, your president? Like, how have you been able to manage the information and get the support that you need to do your work every day? Um, and and did that change dramatically? Um, and were there things you had to sh you know shift to do that well? Yeah, I mean, each institution is unique, right? So in my situation, at least my perspective of my situation, um, I don't think I need to convince anybody at my institution. I don't need to convince my vice president or my president that work needs to be done, that we need to do better, that there's an issue, that these are the issues. Like, I think we all agree on that. Um, but where, in my opinion, um, it seems like my institution maybe has struggled a little bit is in really how engaging students, how to build trust and relationships to bring everybody on board into a place where we can work together to collaborate and empower student voices, in particular marginalized student voices to find solutions. Um, so for me, it's it's really, that's that's the task to figure out, not the, not the convincing anybody, but really trying to well, it's almost like um, translating, you know, it's, you know, I mean, we all speak the same language, but it's almost like the sense of translating. Here's kind of the student experiences I'm understanding and what I'm hearing and what they're sharing with us and translating back and forth between campus leadership and students on the ground that we work with um, to try to, to find solutions. Can I add on to that of beyond, so I, Arapahoe Community College is a predominantly white institution in the suburbs of um, Denver and Littleton, Colorado. And, and I think we've, we've been working hard to recognize those pieces and we have, we have a Chief Inclusive Excellence Officer, but we wanna make sure it doesn't fall within just that role, right? And so I think it's more about amplifying and prioritizing student voices um, is what I see my role as being at various times as a VP um, and my staff voices of, um, it's easy to get lost, I think, you know, in the day to day, right? And so how do we, pri it's okay to prioritize. And I think sometimes we're scared to do that. 
um, you know, well, what if, and what does that mean? And making sure that we're saying, no, this, this is a priority and this needs to be a priority because it's, it's not been a priority long enough. And it's okay now that more resources and more time and more amplification goes to this issue. It, we don't have to equalize them. That's not what equity is. And so I really do see that we've been able to move towards that. We're not where we'd, we'd like to be. Um, and we're a work in progress on that. Um, and it can get very, I mean, this year, of course, can get very frustrating. And, and there's kinds of questions of, you know, when they're talking about, well, what can we take off our plate or what, what do we need to not be doing because there's so much energy in just surviving the pandemic. But I'm very proud that we've been able to continue to center this. Um, and, and again, it just, it, it's hard because there's, again, systematic voices um, of racism that want to quell that prioritization because it might take away from something. <laughs> and so um, having that constant, um, constant prioritization and amplification is what I see as one of my roles of the student's voice and the staff and faculty's voice um, that has been minoritized across the institution for way too long. Um, and, and how do I get out of my, get out of the way, right? Um, as, a, as a white woman, um, I have to get out of the way at times too. Um, my framework is full of systematic racism because of the way I was raised. And so how do I continue to do the work myself on undoing that. And it's not asking my chief inclusive excellence officer to come and do that work. What do I own in my role and how does that get infused and how do I let my staff infuse that throughout theirs? Thank you. Cynthia? Um, yes. Um, thank you for that, Lisa. Um, we did a workshop um, entitled Allies, Advocates, and uh, accomplices. There's something for everyone. There's something that everyone can do. So I appreciate what you offered. Um, I think with Metropolitan Community College being approximately 33% um, minoritized population in Omaha, Nebraska, um, for me, um, I have a huge responsibility, but um, like she said, keeping certain things in the forefront, particularly I want the students of color, particularly black and Latino males and black women to feel absolutely comfortable. And our, we have a large immigrant and refugee population as well. Um, many of them have language barriers yet and still, and they're thriving at the community college because we meet them where they are. Um, but I just, continually ask the questions, how can we improve our faculty demographics? How can we continue to ensure they feel like they belong? Um, how can we provide mental health? How can we provide understanding to those who are, to white students? How can they be allies? How can they be an advocate? Um, what does social justice look like in the classroom? Let's talk about not just um, culturally responsive teaching, but culturally responsive advising. What does that look like? And so um, I had to chuckle when Lisa was talking because, you know, one day it's one thing, and then the next day it's something else, right? <laughs> so what you prioritize on any given day, it's just, it just changes. Thank you, yeah. Kimberly, did you have anything to add? Your original question about who are we leaving out? You mm -hmm. know, when I, when, I, when I think about that, um, I'm not leaving out any particular race in my school or demographics, but I am leaving out my students that we would say like are the cusp students, the students that are average. Um, we're spending a lot of time making sure our gifted students or our high achieving students are still achieving and being challenged. And we're spending a lot of time um, making sure our students that are not engaged are being engaged, getting engaged 
Um, and special ed is always on the forefront because that, that they're my favorite. And so they get prioritized. But, you know, when I think about it, uh, we're leaving out our average kids, our kids in the middle. Mm. You guys, any, any thoughts on just, again, there's no right answer, but just what, like, what have your conversations um, been around students that you may have missed or not been able to um, get in contact with outside of the just keep trying. Uh, have, you know, how how have you had any major strategy conversations or um, things to to move that in a different direction? So one of my assistant principals put together a spreadsheet of all students um, so that we can make sure that we are discussing and talking about all students and not just um, the students on one end of the spectrum. Um, and so that's truly helping us because we're able to look at the spreadsheet, discuss students, document when we've talked about each student or reached out to each student to keep us on track. Um, and I have put a like please out on my Facebook and my social media pages for my students. You know, I can recall last month just doing a very quick three minute video because I'm, I'm worried that some of the students or some of the parents may think like this year's over. You know, my kid hasn't engaged, I haven't done anything, the year is over. And I put out a quick video to say, you know, the year's not over. There are still ways and opportunities that we can hold on, wrap our arms around your child and get them to where they need to be. I mean, I understand as a parent how this time can be very frustrating. And so I think being humble having that grace that you spoke about and putting yourself in the place of where some of our parents are in. Like I said, my daughter is in sixth grade at my school and I see her level of frustration um, and mine as well, being a leader and trying to manage all of this and then be her sixth grade teacher at home. You know, it's easy to give up, especially if your student hasn't been engaging all year long. And so I, put a plea out on our MLK Facebook page that said it's not over. There is still something that we can do to engage and to get you know, your students back on track. Please reach out, call me, call one of the counselors. Um, let's figure this out before next year. And so when I put that plea out, you know, my counselors told me like, okay, Grace, and a lot of parents have been reaching out, they've been calling. So we're getting some kids back in classes and back on track that otherwise I think maybe would have felt like it was over, it was too late. Mm -hmm. So I think just being humble, right? And, and passing no judgment and letting your families and your students know like we're still here. There's still multiple opportunities. And we can get through this together. Like MLK, we, we use the hashtag, we're stronger together. And just being very mindful of that and reminding um, staff that and students and parents. Yeah. Um, so as, as we think about that, um, and we, we kind of started the conversation around education being one of the, one of the uh, civil rights issues of today. Um, clearly that means that there is a lot of work that has to be done. Um, as you think about the fall and then as you think about education from your vantage point in general, um, what has to change? What do we need to be doing to really get to some significant impactful change that gets us closer to equity uh, and decreasing inequity for our students you know, uh, from your perspectives? I think the education that we're teaching our students has to change. The content that we're teaching students, have, it needs to change. Um, providing our teachers with professional development so that they know how to teach a content that is rigorous and relevant for the students that we serve. Um, ensuring that schools have the, the adequate resources um, making sure that our libraries consist of fiction and nonfiction literature that looks like the kids that we're serving, making sure that the education that we're teaching, the lessons that we're teaching is not from a deficit mindset or full of trauma, that it is 
um, indicative of celebrations and contributions of different races. Um, and then supporting students and making sure that they feel um, a sense of belonging in your building um, and a safe space to question what's happening um, and to advocate for their education. Other thoughts here? Um, <clears throat> I agree with what uh, Kimberly stated and I think if you um, look at what the objectives are and the outcomes, um, hold staff accountable to being creative with students to how they get there. So as long as the objectives are met, what might look the, what might look one way for one student could be different for another. But as long as the learning outcomes have been met, that's a, that is a success. As, as long as proficiency is met, that is a success. So I think sometimes, um, you know, we can be rigid and locked in and dug in but we need to be more flexible and um, definitely diversify curriculums, diversify training um, and be more, more inclusive. Yeah. We need to disrupt the entire system. I mean, it starts, I mean, I think with the policing system, right? Like we're responding with policing for social justice issues that are basic needs and mental health needs. We need to have health in regards to it because you can't learn if you're hungry and you're unhealthy and you have trauma induced um, challenges. And we're on a chronological schedule for that. We're not, we're on a chronological agricultural schedule that came from Europe versus a competency-based or a need-based pieces. And so, you know, we have all of these different schedules and different pieces. And so all of our pedagogies get structured around that. And so, I mean, there's so much disruption. I feel it needs to happen that the blurring between credit and non-credit, but the money and well, how do we pay? And it's all based on those kind of things versus, you know, what, what does it take to have a society that cares for their community and can produce what we're hoping um, in the community with, without the inequities and with the inclusiveness and the ability for those that want to, and are kinetic learners and those that are you know, auditory learners, I mean, all the different pieces. But again, it starts you know, with, with children, I think, um, you know, again, if we have two gen, three gen deep inequities and poverty that has been impacted upon them and the traumas of that, and we're asking them to trust systems that are designed to not be trustworthy, yeah, it's, it's, it starts in all those areas. And, and that's so hard for us to imagine stuff that we can't imagine or haven't experienced. Thank you, Lisa. That, that makes me think about policies and procedures. Um, you know, I'm sure it's not happened at any of your institutions, but the one that I work at, you know, sometimes we peel back and open the books and we see policies or procedures that may have been well-intentioned in, you know, in, in 1949 when they were created. Um, <laughs> but they aren't necessarily working for students now, right? They um, are, are barriers. And, and so just what are your thoughts on, on your approach to changing policies and pr procedures? And how are, you, how are you looking at that? Are you looking at that? Um, and what advice do you have on, on um, trying to get some of those things adjusted in, in, in your system? I can start and I think naturally, and, for, and I'll give a quick background. Um, October, 2019, I took 17 students to the African American Museum in Washington, DC. And from there, the students began to question their education. They said, you know, Grayson, why is it that we don't learn about black history 
unless it is a concurrent enrollment class or an ethnic studies class, why isn't Black history a part of U.S. history when in fact Black history is U.S. history? And those groups of students came back and challenged the status quo with Denver Public Schools. Um, they stood up the very next day that we got back from out of town and spoke to Susanna Cadova's then, our, our superintendent then, and questioned their cabinet, her cabinet, um, about where's the black history and why isn't it inclusive in every content area, kindergarten through 12th grade? Um, why do we have to just wait to take ethnic studies or what have you? Um, then the students asked me, Grayson, all of our history teachers, they're white. Send them to the, send them to the museum. I did two weeks later, they went to the museum, right? My history teachers were rewriting their lessons to include black history. So I think a lot of it is awareness and having a strong voice speak up to change things that are happening. Um, then my history teachers and my students both presented to the entire faculty to say, hey, we went to the museum. What the kids are saying is correct. The education that we're teaching them here at MLK is not adequate or relevant for them. Um, and they got more of my staff on board. Um, then the students and the teachers went to the Board of Education in December, and then they went back in January, um, went back in February, and were scheduled to go back in March and the pandemic hit. Then with the death of George Floyd, I had four young ladies that went on that trip that stood up and said, we want to start a podcast. We want our student voice to be heard. And if, you know, Black history is not relevant today, it, it never will be. And so I say all of this to say that their podcast has, you know, everything happens for a reason. And and it's been their podcast that has been heard nationally as well as internationally um, and throughout all of the schools here in DPS. A lot of people are using their podcasts as professional developments. It's helping the awareness and it's helping to bring history um, to teachers, to the district. Um, their podcast first series talked about how right now is the civil rights movement from the eyes of students, right? And they talked about um, your independence is not ours. And that launched on the 4th of July to why black history is important in interviewing a professor from Yale. And then they had a series on generational trauma, healing wounds, 400 years in the making and how generational trauma dates back to slavery. And then they branched off of that and talked about generational trauma and how that shows up in uh, black boys, males, and how teachers are teaching them and how the district is using policies against them. And then the next one was um, generational trauma and how that shows up with black females and how they're being pushed out of school and pushed into the streets. Um, and then from there, they dropped and they wrote a resolution, a policy for Denver Public Schools called No Justice, No Peace that talks about encompassing and bringing in black history, kindergarten through 12th grade in every single content area, um, professional development, the very things that I was mentioning on the previous question, that resolution was written by four of my high school young ladies and DPS passed that resolution on October 22nd. And it clearly states like the superintendent has to state the plan by the end of this school year on how this resolution is going to um, go forth. And so every podcast that my kids have written, right, I use that as professional development to my staff. And so now I have my staff that is predominantly white, understanding the oppression, systematic racism, the equity that is needed, because they're hearing it from students. And then they're reflecting on it with the students. And then as a larger group, with the rest of the staff and then we have you know everything that's happening in the nation the pandemic and the social unrest and so i think having strong voices that will bring the necessary awareness awareness unapologetically um, and not backing down i mean all of the local national and international attention that we've all gotten it's come at a cost right we've gotten a lot of hate mail and death wishes. And sometimes I worry about my students and I try to like, okay, let's take a break. And they're like, no, no break, we're going, right? These are just 
these are threats. They're not going to follow through with them. I mean, I, my girls, I always say like they are a movement within themselves, but having people that are willing to press forward, um, to push the status quo, be very innovative and make these moves is what gets policy to change. And I'm really proud of what they're doing, but I'm also proud of my entire faculty here because they're on board and they're willing to learn and willing to change curriculum and, and, and make those necessary big steps to be an example for DPS. Thank you. I, and I think you, you make a great point when it comes to policy and procedure. The, the best way to change it is to get active and change it. Um, and, um, and I just really love what your students are doing. And it just reminds us that most major movements start from our youth. And we can't forget that as we're educators, you know, we're providing education and platform, but we should also be sitting on that platform and learning from our students simultaneously. Um, we are almost at time, and I know we could have these kinds of conversations all day long. I just want to say thank you guys for being here. Um, to the audience, definitely check out the No Justice, K-N-O-W, No Peace podcast. Um, it's in the, um, in the chat. Thank you, Lisa, for putting it there. But I want to give each panelist just, you know, a couple seconds to just, you know, give a closing remark um, or Jewel or, or, or whatever's on your heart. And, um, and we'll start with uh, Cynthia. Um, I will end the way that I began. If not us, then who? Troy. So as we uh, move out of this pandemic, um, COVID pandemic, hopefully sooner than later, and, and find a way of the, the racial pandemic we're in, to me, the question is, will we just reflexively return to business as usual, or will we use this as an opportunity to strategically and intentionally move forward? Uh, in, in making the change, and in particular, how can we center um, the voices that need to be in that conversation? How can we do that in new and creative ways? Thank you, Kimberly. Well, working in the school, we know that the education system is broken and the pandemic has brought light to that. And so this is the time to get to the root of how this education system was created and truly think about all of the students that we serve and make the necessary changes. Lisa. I would, I really like Cynthia's, if, if not, like what, if not you, then who in that part and um, be brave, be brave in your love and your amplifying of voices that are not yours and, and do something in that that moves it forward um, regardless of you know I think at times that can be overwhelming and especially now um, but but be brave if not you then who and how can you amplify something unheard thank you thank you again to all the panelists and to all the listeners thank you guys for tuning in to another month of your comfort being uncomfortable we really really appreciate you being there and remember um, to, to the point of our panelists we're only strong as we allow ourselves to be. And so just think outside of the box, um, find ways that we can get active, whatever way you can get active from your perspective, do that. Um, and let's keep pushing this conversation forward. Let's be comfortable being uncomfortable when it comes to our supervisors and folks in charge. Sometimes the best way to have the conversation is to have it um, and, and not worry about how you get there. Go, go ask the question, go show the data, go ask for the data. But with that said, um, again, thank you so much. And I want to turn it back over to Carol from Global Minded. And again, I always want to say thank you to Global Minded for the platform and supporting these super important conversations on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Carol? Thank you so much, Ryan. And what a great experience the last hour just to get to know each of you and how powerful each of you are in the work that you're doing and how courageous. Um, I think we, we feel strongly that at this time we have to work with uncommon collaborators. We have to have the voice of students at the table. We can't solve for them without them. And, um, you know, um, Kimberly, we had your students on in February for Black History. They were amazing and uh, people just loved uh, their message and their power and their their actions. Um, I think we've got to come out of these silos that are so old school of the past and we've got to 
really be open to listening to understanding. I think a lot of um, people, I just finished reading, you know, cast the last couple of days. And it's like people of the dominant class, they've got to be able to understand in a bigger way and pass the mic and create these experiences that um, can really reverse, you know, centuries of things that don't represent the richness of, of our country, of our world. And this is our time right now where we can do that. So on that, I'll just say, I hope you all will join us for um, the Global Minded Conference starting tomorrow. And also that you'll um, encourage your students to go to our website, because when students who are predominantly white institutions, or even if they're at HBCUs or Hispanic serving and they come to the table and they see leaders like you, they see themselves in you. And we just encourage, we have a lot of students following at these sessions, reading our daily newsletter. And um, that opens up a lot of vistas that any one college may not provide all of that wisdom and diversity to students. So um, just wanna encourage all of you to um, help with that. And Ryan's session next month is gonna be within the context of, um, of our conference and it's gonna be really terrific. And it's gonna be about the unsung heroes of the HR directors um, that have really um, borne so much of this the last year of everything you guys described today. So thank you everybody and um, stay safe and um, healthy and just thanks for making this a priority and all of you who um, tuned in today will have the link for everybody tomorrow. Celeste will be able to post it and um, we look forward to seeing you for whatever events in the next 10 weeks and definitely for Ryan's session um, in May. So thanks again to all of you. Thanks everybody. See you next time. Thanks so much. It's great to get to know everybody. Thank you. Bad. Bye bye. Thanks. Take care, bye, everyone. Everybody.